we're showing you what we're talking about. You see this bend here? And if you sit there in the middle with your hips, and this under the back of your legs, you'll find that you now have this, this action, this springiness. And uh, all we have to do now is to make it. But if you, in many cases, you can't do this for long because the willows will part and you'll fall through. Then you gather twig tips here. We have a small arm load. A good hug size bundle of twigs can make a very resilient bed. We are in a spruce deficient environment, so we're using just the twigs of any shrub we can lay our hands on. And here we will put on some, basically, our head or shoulders to our hips. These things at 45 degrees to the center, to the butt, the butt ends on the edge of the like so. That will give you the most bounce to the ounce. And we go along systematically using small enough handfuls that by the time this amount is used up, that'll help to give more resiliency to the bed and also keep you from falling through your, your box spring, so to speak. And you don't have to go beyond the, the hips because the legs require very little. Now, you can see here that actually this system, even on a hard floor, could uh, give you considerable bounce by itself. Now, one thing that's deficient here is the pillow. And by putting sticks underneath this, you elevate your head to a comfortable level. Here we have a trim stick like this to make a perfect pillow, but it's put on here underneath the stuff. Now, as you use this, some of these things will behave more. Now, if you want even uh, uh, some more luxury, then you pick grass, but the grass here has been grazed. So we, we have handfuls of grass like this that can be put on if it's long enough. If it was natural, we would have perhaps a substitute of the grass for these sticks or put a final layer depending on your circumstances. We're assuming you're going to be sleeping in your clothes. Now here, you lay down and you feel that things aren't right. Well, ah, that's a, you can see I got resilience under the hips so that my bed gives as I turn. Uh, and especially if you sleep on your side, you need that layer we just put on. Bed, now normally if it was snowing, we would probably build our shelter first. If it was cold, we would have built our fire first. Now basically, if you were staying here one night, instead of piling up your fuel, any nice sticks, you would lean against here and build your fuel pile to look like a lean-to. And by morning, it might even be that the whole shelter is gone. The a normal person builds a shelter and a big pile of fuel, and when the morning comes to leave, they still have the shelter standing and the fuel is gone. <coughs> it uh, uh, saves a lot of effort by utilizing your fuel pile as your major protection in a, in a short while. Then we might try to block off with grass or moss or whatever, chink the logs up to a elbow to fingertip above the bed, that is, you want to chink it to the extent that where you're laying on the bed, you don't get the cold air sifting through. They don't watch and a big chunk comes down. Sure keeps you warm. Now a, a lean-to has got five components, or uh, a home in the bush, I would say as opposed to just a lean-to. It has five components. Component number one is your heat source. Now, sometimes you can build a shelter that the sun, reflecting off the snow or the ice, will be captured in the shelter. But that's usually a fairly technical shelter requiring a bubble made out of polyethylene, which in a certain form would be called a greenhouse. As you're aware, a greenhouse is an enclosure where the sun is uh, rays get trapped inside and the interior warms up considerably more than the outside. Here we don't have any of that effect. We've got, uh, the only thing we got going for us basically is protection from any wind. And that's what this end protection would be. And then protection from the cold air that uh, has effect on you from the far side of the fire. And that's, uh, we call that convection barrier. 
as well. Wind protection, convection barrier, they're similar. Then the third, uh, not, in, not, not necessarily in the list of uh, importance, order of importance, is the protection from the cold of the ground. But basically, if it's uh, too cold to sleep, uh, even in the daytime, for example, uh, if you had a shelter made out of polyethylene and survival blankets and parachute in the right way, right now the interior of the shelter could be cozy enough that you'd be sleeping in your clothing probably until 3 or uh, 4 o'clock. That is, there are certain times when you choose to sleep in the warmer part of the day and be active when it's the hardest to, to keep warm, which is somewhere from 2 o'clock in the morning until the crack of dawn. Here you're going to have a fire going in front because that's the only feasible way when it gets bitter cold when nothing else works. That fire would be a good step away and these logs, if they are heavy, they should be made to warm up with that fire. And what that means is that when you are sitting in front of your fire and the fire has been burning nicely and then the fire dies down you've got to put on more wood. Normal person just keeps adding little sticks of wood to the normal fire. The learned person will heap up way more fuel on this fire than he could possibly stand sitting on the bed. Now to re reiterate, you've got your fire, that's number one. You've got your protection from the far side, which could essentially be your fuel pile. That's number two. Protection from the wind, number three. Protection from the ground, number four. And overhead protection from rain or snow, which is usually the first thing that an inexperienced person wants to build, but it's usually the last thing you incorporate into your shelter because you can often sleep when the snow is snowing on you and even if you're wet and warm you'll sleep. But here a section that has been done with grass. If it's a big crack, you sometimes uh, reduce the amount of grass by using small sticks. So put a little bit of grass in there and then lean the stick against it. Uh, but generally once you have put up your, now up here it's getting too high, you might choose not to bother. We're all we're saying is, is uh, chink it about uh, oh, 50 centimeters less than a meter above the bed. Matter of fact, in some cases, if you chink too high and it's raining, you could have a problem with dripping. So you only want to chink that interval about where you are laying and, and the, the, uh, the, you get the coverage. And up here you get a greater porosity so the smoke so the fire acts in a better way. So we stuff that in there. We might use bark that's come off of the trees in some cases, especially the bigger cracks. This bark could be laid on this way. Whatever it is, in a combination, you can, not common to find birch just about any time you want it, but in this environment we don't have spruce trees, so we have, happen to have some birch uh, in, in place of that. And you can see that in the uh, rain, you would actually be able to shingle your roof uh, quite readily with stuff like this. Short pieces can be uh, used to effect now that you've got the first layer on by setting them end to end and every once in a while putting up a long stick to keep things in place and you just keep adding this until you have a solid, well of course perfectly straight poles would be ideal. These crooked sticks they're put on last to hold things in place more than uh, participate in producing a absolutely uh, windproof wall because of the uh, shelter of this nature in this type of environment. As you can see with all the debris there, probably in an hour you'd have a fairly comfortable shelter of this nature. And the important thing about the logs as opposed to boughs is they have weight. And the weight is what absorbs the warmth. Boughs have very little weight. Therefore, they can't absorb the warmth like the, the poles and the logs can. And the smoke and everything will go out that end. But the inexperienced person puts this big end out here for some reason, and then the smoke and everything is caught into that end and made to swirl in this sort of still air space. Uh, made to, uh, the wind will eddy. A lot of people feel you should put the back to the wind. But the problem there is that because of the nature of this, of the of the way still air and everything acts, the wind comes over and starts to grab the fire and roll it around like this so that you end up having uh, more smoke in your shelter. Of all the different orientations, the ridge pole is parallel to the wind and you block off this portion 
and the wind comes by here and the effect it has on the fire, the smoke and everything is blown well past before it gets a chance to be grabbed and swirled in here. This is the same principle as uh, not marching in step on a bridge. And if you keep pushing and relaxing and pushing so that you can push harder and harder and cause the thing to, to wave, you have the situation now we've heard it break where I stopped. Now it'll push over very easy. Now sometimes a tree, and then the next time we will show the use of the push pole, that if you can push way up there, and you'll often push down a tree more readily, one that would be impossible to push down here, you'll push it down because you're pushing way up. But here now we have broken it and we find that we can we can push it where we want. Now if we had three trees that we could fall to make them cross, we could light a fire at that intersection and burn the logs through and then make them more portable. So you could push down a very big tree and still get it to your campfire by burning it into sections. And here we go. And if you do it right, now if you've got a sharp point or chisel on the end of your push pole, by putting it higher up like this, you'll push down uh, a much larger tree. And you use the same technique, except you get the pole rested on there, get on your belly button and get that rhythm going, and you go there, because I fell. Now I was well back, because sometimes when you fell things on other trees, watch that the stump doesn't come up and hit you in the chin. But generally, once your pole or log is draggable to the fire, then don't bother sectioning it. Let the fire do the work. Here, for instance, we can do like this. And, and generally, our fires are made out of sticks that are roughly fingertip to fingertip long. If your sticks get shorter than nose to fingertip, you'll find that you lose a lot in the way that you can control an open fire. For example, if this tree is fairly sound, this might be a way that I might splinter it to kindling. If I use the and you know, I'll find that many of these slivers sometimes can be torn apart with the hands with the finer sticks. Or we might take this and hit it to loosen it some more. The right way will. will cause you to get smaller pieces where the interior of the wood would be dry. Even wet, soaking wet birch bark will catch on fire. And if we were wandering around and we see lots of loose bark, we, we should uh, uh, grab handfuls of it and put it into our back pocket. A handful of grass. You guys we don't have the benefit of spruce branches. So the birch bark will ignite the grass. The grass will now have to ignite twigs. And if I don't have twigs and I have a knife, here I have made a, taken a few pieces of bark and sort of laid them out to make a kind of a platform. And let's say it is windy and raining, I might choose to light my fire here first. And once it's, uh, the flame is going, then I could put it where I want it. Cool. You don't use uh, horizontal uh, wood for this purpose. You use the best wood you can find and generally something that's fairly sound. And we want to break it up into uh, a few manageable pieces here. Uh, well, and hopefully the splinters will also come into use if we get into the right sort of thing. This is a little more readily usable. There, there are certain willows that we, if we wander around, we'll find that we can break them on our knee. These are the splinters I'm talking about, the finger thick pieces of wood, which come after the shavings we make with our knife, and we would learn how to be able to extract these splinters in a variety of ways. Here we got about two trees close together. There, I can make all kinds of finer splinters. Try to break them up as much. I might even split them with my knife. The grass is too fine, this is too coarse. Here we might be carrying an appropriately sharpened knife. And we can now make shavings of, of, of paper thinness if we so choose, provided that the knife is sharpened properly. Well, two, one complete curl, 20 if possible. The wood is very brittle. Not all woods will shave. Now you might want to create, if you have nothing else, you probably create 100 shavings like that. 
and you can put them into a more manageable